So Baroness Greenfield, it's such an honor to be with you. And you're a globally renowned neuroscience. Um, you have done cutting edge research and you're the first woman to hold the position of director of the Royal Institution of Great Britain. These are such tremendous accomplishments. I'm curious, what is it both personally um, and what are the actions you've taken to be so successful in your career? Oh, I think, first of all, please call me Susan. Otherwise, it sounds like I'm something out of Alice in Wonderland or something. <laughs> I know in America as well. You're not familiar with these titles and they sound very strange. So please call me Susan. Um, it's hard because you don't say I'm going to deliberately do this or that. You are what you are. And I think I've had some great breaks in my life, um, which some people would have interpreted as being disadvantages. So uh, my parents are very poor, for example. My dad was an electrician and my mum was a dancer. She was a chorus girl in the war entertaining you guys the GIs in the war she <laughs> she was entertaining the troops wow uh, yeah so I think I had a very unconventional upbringing um also because my dad was Jewish and my mum wasn't so it was a mixed marriage at a time when there was huge prejudice on both sides so I think this was marvelous because I realized early in life that first you can't have everything you want straight away like I wanted a pony and that was completely <laughs> for example. Um, and I also learned that the important things in life, which my parents gave me, was love and support, and that material things um, weren't that, that special as much as your mum being there when you came home from school, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and I think also, because we had no money, unlike a lot of middle class kids who are poor things nowadays, sent to endless self improvement classes and um, are told to do uh, various extracurricular activities, I was just left to be bored. And I think. Allowing a kid to be bored is a brilliant thing because you then have to make your own stimulation. So, you know, I drew pictures, I went to the library, I made up stories. Yeah. And I think giving that strong narrative is a very good thing to do rather than have the expectation that people are going to stimulate you or entertain you. You have to do it yourself. Yeah. And I think it does give you a very um, healthy outlook on life. So the first thing I had was poor parents. That was the first great break. The second was um, having parents who were not conventional, um, being, as I said, a mixed marriage and my mum having been theatrical and so on. So that actually gives you a strong sense of identity and individuality. You realise you're different from other people anyway, so um, you respect that in others. Um, and also I remember once going to a party when I was about 14 because I went to a single-sex school and allegedly at this party there were going to be boys, these alien creatures. You know, <laughs> I'd never... And so my mother... Um, what they're going to think of me. And mum said, no, you should ask yourself, what do you think of them? Ah. Um, so those kind of things, I think, are much more valuable to have, to be loved, to be allowed to use your imagination, to be allowed to do what you like in the sense because you're bored, you know, um, and at the same time to have that kind of wisdom and that sort of support, I think, stood me in great stead. So the other thing, of course, is I had a more formal education was to have various mentors and someone wants um, to find a mentor or someone who believes in you more than you believe in yourself and I've been very fortunate along the way to have people who when things have been very bad or very low or you're doubting yourself um, are constructive you know what they say that it's a tough love but they're constructive I think that's been good as well mm. that's a definition I've never heard of a mentor and I love that yeah really changes the framework so what advice do you have for young people who are trying to rise to the top in whatever field they've chosen? Um, I think the first thing is to make sure you enjoy what you do, that you're not trying to rise to the top just because it's high status or it's well paid or other people tell you you should do it. Because in order to be successful, you have to love what you do. You have to really, and you have to have a passion and you have to be prepared. As someone once said, you know, take what you want, then pay for it. Nothing comes easy. If, if you want to do something, it's going to require a lot of hard work. And unless you really enjoy it above and beyond the fact that it brings you money, then really there's no point. So the first thing is you have to be really passionate about what you do. And my own view, again, is also to get rid of this phrase, which I personally hate, we have in the UK a lot, of work-life balance. I can't bear that phrase because I don't even have it in the States, but it implies that work is something horrible that has to a separate part of your life and for me you know I play squash I go shopping I, I like having a drink I like going to parties and I like working you know but it's all the piece it's all the same thing it's as if work is some horrible drudge hmm. so 
can do those other things. It's another expression of who I am. And I know that's a huge luxury. But if uh, my advice to young people would be, if you can see what you're doing as another expression of you, as a facet of you, of your individuality, as opposed to you just fulfilling a role or of being a functionary, if you're bringing something to the party that is unique, that's an expression of you, that is the most fulfilling thing. And I realize that's a huge privilege because people working on assembly lines or in very um, low paid or dreary jobs can't have that. But I think for people who are professional and trying, you know, it wouldn't be wonderful if we could make more people in the world have that kind of feeling. So tell us in lay terms that all of us can understand yeah. <laughs> about your brain and consciousness research and how it can apply to leaders in business. Okay. Okay, well, there's three aspects to my own work on the brain. And it all stems from the same theme, if you like, which is looking at new things that are happening in the brain that no one's discovered before. New, uh, new things that, well, obviously, the brain's known it's over a long time, but new things that scientists um, are discovering. And there's three aspects to this. Um, the first, and we'll come, I'm sure, back to each of these. The first is the impact of technology on the young brain. Mm. That's something that fascinates me a lot because we know the human brain has exquisitely evolved the human brain to adapt to the environment. So that's why we occupy more ecological niches than any other species on the planet. We don't run fast, we don't see well, but gosh, what we do fantastically is we learn. Yeah? Mm. And it's this ability to adapt, whether you're born in New York or London or fifth century Athens, you will adapt to that culture, that world, that way of life, so you maximally thrive in that world. Yeah. So because we do that, because our brains are exquisitely evolved to adapt, it follows that if the world now is a two-dimensional one with just hearing and vision, yeah, where you're not actually seeing someone face to face, uh, then clearly you'll adapt to that. You'll adapt to a world mm. that is what the screen offers. So we can explore that a little bit. So that's the first aspect I do. Uh, the second is consciousness, which is one of the most exciting questions, and we take it for granted. But what you are experiencing now, this first-hand, first-person experience that no one else can share with you. You know, I can't hack into your head and see the world through your eyes, yeah. or vice versa. And however articulate you are, or however much you love someone, or however poetic you are, or musical, no one, no one, no one can see the world as you do. And that is consciousness, it's what you lose every night. Um, and it's something that the more you think about it, your brain turns in cartwheels trying to understand where is the little man or little woman inside that's reporting all this. Anyway, so that's that one, we can come back to that. Wow. And third, then third area, um, is dementia, which of course is a big problem both in the US and the UK, um, which is we cannot put up with the situation as it is. The burden on society, both in humanitarian and psychiatric costs as well as economic costs are getting worse and worse. Mm. And everyone agrees we have to do something. And um, my own research is very left of field. It's very different from the traditional approach, which is why I think it might stand a chance, because for the last 10 years, there's been no new drug at all. And so I can talk about that if you like. But so there are the three aspects I say that sound very different, which is what I call mind change, the impact of technology on young brains, the more philosophical question of what is consciousness, and then the third, which is developing a novel treatment for dementia, um, which sound very different, but actually they come from the same core bit of knowledge or information, which is understanding about how, how the brain works as much as we can. What is it that makes a great teacher? Okay, I think that's a really good question. There was a brilliant advert a long time ago in England for recruiting teachers, and it had then famous people, let's say like Tony Blair, our then Prime Minister, um, saying names that no one recognised. In his case, he said his name, Eric Anderson. And then it had a series of celebrities saying names that no one else would recognise. And the slogan that came up at the end, everyone remembers a good teacher. Ah, uh, We all know, because these were the teachers, yeah. And I bet you, Jennifer, you probably have someone that taught you, that you remember, you know. I had somebody taught me ancient Greek, which is why I specialized in ancient Greek. Had it been spot welding, it would have been spot welding. So um, I think the most exciting thing is to look at that and to say, well, what's made a good teacher there? Is it something, someone who's really excited the person? It's really got them joining up the dots in a new way. It's really got them motivated. They will go to the library themselves and look things up because mm. they so want to learn about it. So what makes a good teacher? is someone, it's a bit like a mentor, someone who can really excite you and inspire you in a way, incidentally, that an iPad never, ever, ever will. And I'm personally sad when I see people triumphantly pointing to distribution of iPads in classrooms. Um, really? And I said, some of the money go to improving teachers' pay, for example, it'd be much better use of the, of the cash. But so, so what makes a good teacher is someone 
who really is across the subject themselves, who's therefore well paid, not demoralized, not overworked, not tired, yeah, all of which in the UK teachers are because of the poor conditions that they're subject to. Yeah. But at the same time, someone that can really get the get the people excited. And I think that in turn has to be that you yourself are enthusiastic, because you'll know nothing beats enthusiasm. You know, I'd, I would much rather work with or be taught by or have as pupils people that are enthusiastic rather than someone that knows it all and is, you know, cynical and you know, um, sneery and not not switched on. So I think it has to be enthusiasm and it has to be, again, a love of what you do and a love of your subject. That's really interesting um, because, I, you know, society so often rewards people who seem to know it all <laughs> as yeah, opposed to the enthusiastic. <laughs> One of your American, James Serber, who said, it's better to ask some of the questions than know all of the answers. Mm, asking questions. For me, when I used to interview for medicine at Oxford, which is very competitive and impressive, you know, where the kids would come up, what I would look for wasn't so much that someone that knew a load of facts, but someone that asked questions. Because mm. about it, someone that asks questions is someone that's really thinking about something, and there's a certain humility there, and yeah. a certain mindedness in someone that asks questions, whereas... How many times, Jennifer, have you sat next to men at dinner parties and they just talk at you all evening and just tell you facts? A million uh, times. <laughs> and what, are we impressed by them? No, we are not. Yeah. So, you know, someone that has an open mind and asks questions yeah. is much more, I think, fertile grounds than, um, than someone that just wants to show you what they know. Is it similar for leaders? What makes a great leader? Okay, well, I think a good example there well, is to look at leaders that are acknowledged as such as opposed to just managers, because sometimes people are competent managers, but they're not necessarily good leaders. So hmm. if we take the example, and I'll name names of someone called Gordon Brown, you may have heard of, who was our senior financial man. He was Chancellor of the Exchequer. And he did that quite well and was solid and knew his stuff. When he became prime minister, he was terrible. Everyone agreed. You know, he was a very poor prime minister. I'll say this on, on camera, I don't think. Yeah. Um, so I think that was an example of someone who was very competent and very good at finance, but wasn't someone who inspired people. Now, look at someone like Martin Luther King, let's say, or Churchill, let's say, people that everyone would say were, were good leaders, or Gandhi, another one. Yeah. Um, let's say Martin Luther King, I have a dream. I think that is the crucial thing. A leader is someone who can set out a vision. Now, a manager is someone who's competent, who does things well, but if you can say to someone, say, say I was your boss, Jennifer, and this is unlike, and I say, Jennifer, imagine if we could do this or that. What do you think? That's much more inspirational than saying, Jennifer, do this, do that, or, you know, where's your figures, yeah? or where your KPIs. I hate that phrase. Yeah? Right. Uh, well, okay, what boxes have you ticked recently? You know? If instead you both sit back and say, imagine, if only we could do this. Mm. You know, what you're doing is playing to the person's imagination and you're empowering them mm. you know, to, to help go forward rather than just to be reactive and I think I mean I'm not I'm a neuroscientist what do I know about management but I for me the the way I work with my group is to say imagine if this was the case and just imagine if we could measure this or that and then we could do this you know and that's what really I think um, touches people and ignites them rather than just being told they've got to do a load of things and tick boxes Talk a little bit about how your brain research can affect and impact learning organizations. Okay, I think what's very important, and I'm asked quite often to, to talk of, about my subject to the corporate world and to a whole range of different sectors, because I think what most businesses want, what most organizations want, is what are the goods and services that people are going to need in the future? How are they going to manage their workforce? And you know, um, what are the keys to leadership? Um, how can we harness whatever it is in our environment currently to deliver the one thing you can't buy, which is creativity, which I think is very important. So I think the sort of work that we as neuroscientists can do are of value to the private sector and to business um, more than ever before because we're living in such a changing environment where given that the environment changes the brain and the environment currently is unprecedented, it follows the brain might start to... Um, behave in an unprecedented way, which the more we can anticipate, the more both for your workforce and for your businesses um, and for the consumers um, will have to be valuable, not least also because as a citizen of the 21st century, you're going to want to probably make the most of life anyway. So um, 
I can unpack that a little bit if, if you like. Um, basically, the digital world um, has many benefits. For example, raised IQ, instant access to information, improved sensory motor coordination, and, and so on. And as you may be aware, I've written a book called Mind Change, which is coming out in the States on the 10th of February yes. uh, next week, yeah, which covers some of those things. But it's too complacent to say that we're in some wonderful high-tech world because, as always, there's a price. And for every hour you're sitting in front of a screen, that's an hour not giving someone a hug, not mm. feeling on your face, not smelling a rose. Now, if we're in a world as we are now, where many people, especially young people, can wake up in the morning, they can go shopping, they can go dating, they can play games, they can work, um, all without meeting another human being, uh. we're now for the first time in a parallel universe. So whereas technology in the past has been a means to an end for the world, the three-dimensional world, yeah, um, whether it was television gives you, you know, in the evenings that was something to watch as a, as a family, or the printing press gave you books that gave you insights into the human condition, um, a car got you from A to B, a fridge kept your food cold. But all of these things were to enhance your real world existence. Mm. Time, this is so pervasive that we have a parallel world existence, and it's a world, sadly, that some people escape to. And what I would like to see is how we can harness the technology to deliver a better quality of life in the real world. Now that, I think, any business that did that or could offer that as a good or service, I think would be probably ahead of the curve as opposed to just marketing video games, say, something like this. Um, so we then look at what the digital native, as they're called, you know, people were born probably about 2000, you know, what they are now like. And as well as having some good qualities, like very good facility with computers and, and being able to multitask, that's not necessarily a good thing because we now know that the way the brain is responding to that is not necessarily ideal. We have short attention spans, we have low-grade aggression, we have low self-esteem, we have poor empathy skills, mm. uh, we have enhanced recklessness, uh, so we have a rather weak sense of identity. So one has to look at this profile, work out what it might be, and then say, if you're a business person, if you're a leader, and you have a workforce with that profile, what can you do to inspire them? to bring out the best in them, to paint them a vision. And I think these things are possible. I mean, obviously I haven't got a quick sound bite answer, but I think that's how neuroscience and what we are documenting and seeing, um, as I tried to do in my book, and I tried to um, translate the rather technical papers into words ordinary human beings could understand so that they can make their own views. So there's no easy answer, but it's something that has to be thought through and unpacked rather than people thinking, oh, well, we're just sleepwalking to this, it's too late or it's all fantastic. Um, as someone said, for every complex situation, there's always a simple answer and it's always wrong. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is to think about it. So um, there's those aspects to it. And I think that there's things that we can do. We can you know, design software, we can shape the environment of the education system. We can um, think about how to give kids something more exciting to do rather than just sit there like glassy eyed zombies, you know? Yeah. Um, there's ways in which we can change the culture and I know that's possible and I don't know I think in New York you still wear fur coats don't you because in England um, you don't wear fur coats anymore right and it's not against the law when I was growing up ladies aspired to having a mink coat right and now if you were in England don't back New York but if you went out in England in a fur coat you would get harangued and shouted at no one would dare wear one you just wouldn't dare to do this because of the response you would get on the street from people um, there's no law against it, but the culture's changed. You know, yes. changed awareness has changed our people now. You know, people aren't stupid, and I think the more we can raise awareness and people are, are conscious of all the options and um, where the implications, they will make their own decisions. But they have to be informed, and we have to talk about it. Mm. In Mind Change, which is a fascinating book that I feel like anyone can read and apply to whatever industry they are in. Um, what is the central theme, and who's your target audience there? Well, I'll explain first that the title Mind Change was to deliberately echo climate change, because I felt that just as climate change is impacting on our society in a way that, say, 30 years ago, we wouldn't have contemplated. So mind change is similar, and it's similar in four ways. Um, first, it's unprecedented. Yeah, it's the first time this has happened. Okay. Second, it's global. Um, third, it's controversial, obviously. Um, and fourth, it's multifaceted. And by multifaceted, 
I mean, there's many questions that need to unpack. It's not a simple question. So rather like with climate change, there's carbon sequestration and water shortages and so on. So with mind change, there's issues of social networking and identity and video games and violence and recklessness or search engines and how you convert information into knowledge. So in all these different aspects, there are questions that need their own space and turn to be unpacked. So in that sense, it's like climate change. So the book was called Mind Change because of those four similarities, okay. those four parallels with climate change. However, what I, my take home message is that unlike climate change, it's in our hands to do something. Climate change, as far as I understand it, is damage limitation. Whereas mind change doesn't have to be like that. For the first time ever, a kid now has a one in three chance of living to be 100, right? And most of us in our privileged lives, you know, like to think we've got a second 50 years to our lives. So yeah. I can ask you, Jeff, what do you want to do with the second 50 years of your life? You know, are you just going to play Sudoku? Or you know, are you going to be like Warren Buffett or, um, I don't know, or Desmond Tutu or the Queen or, you know, all these people in their 80s who are living valuable, exciting, interesting lives. They're not just treading water, you know? yeah. So what I would like to see then is some emphasis on how we can really live our lives to the full for all of our lives, not just, you know, for the first bit. Mm. Um, and in order to do that, we have to ask what we want out of life, you know, and how can we harness the technology to give us an environment where we can express ourselves in a way individuals never had the chance on mass to do before. Mm. So I take her message is really... Um, to get people to think about what they want of the 21st century, what they want of the 21st century technology, because I don't think people are thinking that through. It's not meant as scaremongering. It's not meant really as a wake-up call. It's just meant to say, look, this is something that's a very powerful change in our lives. Like 30 years ago, someone said, look, climate change is happening. What are we going to do? Yeah. And you know, I feel like saying, so this is happening now. Just look around you. It's even easier to see the change compared to climate change. Just look at kids now you know with their yeah. <laughs> head things in their ears and, and looking at screens and not talking to each other just look around you um and surely we need to think about is this the way we want to be headed and what do we want to do and how can we help these people and certainly for business you know how is your business going to make the most of that environment it's for the benefit of everyone how are you going to do that mm. and i think this is a wonderful opportunity to be innovative and exciting rather than just making more video games you know as yeah. i think there's a way in which or more website designs or something you know there's right. that one can do um that actually impact on the three-dimensional world rather than seducing people away from it and i think that that would be the take-home message my target are is basically anyone with a brain which most people have one hope, yeah? <laughs> it's all about the brain you know? so it's not meant for what we would call the chattering classes in england that means that it's not meant just middle i would like parents to read it you know a, and anyone who's got who's interested in, in impacting on society and contributing to it really and, and i'd like to think it wasn't certainly not just for academics or scientists mm -hmm. i've made great effort to make sure it was digestible for everyone so you discuss in the book how the way that we use the internet, Google searching, et cetera, it really puts a premium on just finding quick information rather than deep knowledge and understanding. So can you talk a, a little about how this affects education and the business world? I think people often confuse the fact that people can give correct answers with the end point of education or indeed of, of business. Yeah. Um, so we know a parent can give an answer to something. And an example I like to give is of my little brother, um, who's much younger than me. So um, when he was three, I was 16, 13 years difference. And I hated him. And I tried to torture him as much as I was allowed. <laughs> torture took the form, because obviously I couldn't do anything invasive. Much so the torture, while it was forcing him to learn Shakespeare when he was three years old, I thought this was very funny. So he learned like a little parrot. He learned Macbeth, it's a Macbeth play, Shakespeare's play, Macbeth. And in it, I don't know how familiar you are with the play, but there's a very famous soliloquy which goes, um, out, out, brief candle, life is but a poor player, struts and frets. So I had you said to him, Graham, um, what does that mean? Do you understand what you're saying, out, out, brief candle? He would have said something like, well, I have a candle on my birthday cake, and I blow it out. What he couldn't have seen was that the extinction of the candle was really a way of talking about the extinction of life, about the extinction of death. Now, understanding, therefore, really, to my mind, is seeing one thing in terms of something else. Yeah, it's the more you understand something, the more you can put it into a context, the more you can see it in terms of other things. Yeah, 
Otherwise, it's just information, which is why isolated facts, let me be brutal, are not very interesting. And people that just tell you facts is not very interesting. Um, I'm sure in the States you have um, a, a game called Trivial Pursuits. Yeah. Yeah. Where people just know facts, or there's another one we have pub. We have pubs in England. We have these pub quizzes where now no one would regard anyone who was good at pub quizzes or trivial pursuits as on a par with a Nobel Prize winner. It just wouldn't be the case. This is not the pinnacle of intellectual endeavour. Yeah, mm. even someone might know lots and lots of facts. Yeah. So knowing facts is fine, but you're turning yourself in a way into a sort of computer or other second-rate computer. You know, you're just giving a response to an answer. Right. Uh, and certainly the way science is taught in schools and that have, uh, that is sadly because it's a measurable outcome in education especially people will say well that's it we're done and dusted you know job done but i think we're missing a trick in that if you probe on how well someone understands something that's the crucial mission it's only when you really understand something that you can join up the dots in a new way and that's really exciting because mm-hmm. that's how you have a new idea or you suddenly see a new significance in something um, but it does require what I call a conceptual framework. That's to say, you need enough dots in order to join them up in different ways and new ways. And I think that if we are narrow-minded and too focused on question and answer or instant response on processing information, valuable though that may be, we are missing a huge trick in the toolkit of what the human brain can do, which computers cannot do, which is to understand, to deeply understand something. And the more you can connect up, the more astonishing it is. For example, there was an um, Australian physician called Burnett who realized you could import the principles of evolution, Darwinian evolution, into immunology. Um, and so he made this astonishing connection between the way natural selection works and <laughs> natural history with the immune system. I mean, an astonishing leap of, you know, wow. now, yeah, but the more you can see a connection or a link, A, it's exciting for you, it's beneficial for everyone else, and for me, education should help you do that. Mm-hmm. And in order to do that, you need time, you need confidence, and you need to know enough different things in order to try and make connections between them, as opposed to just doing knee-jerk reflexes. So that's something I do feel quite strongly about, that um, the more you can foster real understanding, as opposed to a load of little parrots. I mean, do you remember um, the hothouse children? Remember the hothouse children then a while ago? Were, okay, these were kids who from a very early age, from babies, the parents had flashcards and they gave little responses and they were like performing monkeys, you know. Oh. I, don't, I don't think any of them won the Nobel Prize. I don't think any of right. them wrote a Pulitzer, you know, piece of literature. I don't think anyone... Uh, or or no, affected the world like Gandhi, like you were saying. Yeah, exactly. No one wrote a symphony. You know? So just because you might have a fast and, and quick way of processing information, um, and that's, again, I think, a mistake that people often make when they take um, sort of cognitive enhancers like modafinil. They think, I'm going to have a better memory than someone else. Right. I'll just... Yeah. That, that's getting it all wrong. You're, you're, you're becoming a poor computer, you know. <laughs> I don't think Einstein necessarily or Shakespeare, you know, would have, have done those things well. You know, it was more the only thing they had in common was they had nothing in common. Mm. Namely, they were highly original thinkers. Yeah? And I think, for me with the increasing automation, let the computers do all that slog, that information processing. We should now be bringing innovation and insight and imagination and creativity and new ways of seeing things, which they can't do, the screens can't do. So how do teachers and businesses mitigate this trend, this effect? Trends, you know, it's not like Solaris, you know, the trends aren't going to just take over as some can grow. We're in control. And I think, first of all, we have to realize that we you know, are empowered, or we should be. You're a citizen of the 21st century. You know, we shouldn't be thinking that we're being overtaken by the computers or by trends, like with the fur coat trend. Or look at smoking and cancer. Look at, um, I don't know, sunbathing. You know, when I was a kid, everyone sat... I remember we used to put cooking oil on ourselves. Yeah. And, was, and to get brown, you know. Right. <laughs> That was a trend. I did it too. <laughs> that anyone does anymore, you know. And your hair with an ordinary flat iron, we don't do that anymore. Yeah, so just because people like doing something or have done it doesn't mean to say it's eternal and that one can't, by changing the environment and the agenda and the priorities and the options and so on, of course, you know, we can now. I think with education, the first thing to focus on, the be all and end all of education starts and ends with the teacher. It starts and ends with the teacher. And if you, the teacher's not engaged, or is demoralized or tired, then nothing else will work. Nothing. Whereas if the teacher can't smell no, 
and is really believes in her pupils and her students or his students, then that is what you need. Mm -hmm. And whilst it's been shown, as I cite in my book, that yes, iPads can be valuable, but only under supervision. You, know, yeah. you don't just give them an iPad and expect them to be excited and stimulated and creative and have insights. That comes from a person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the tools. So I think what we need to do is to revisit the value of the teacher and the face-to-face -face communication. And the, like the, for example, there was a very depressing um, broadcast from Northern Ireland in, on our BBC where there was a teacher who'd got a speech therapist in because these primary school children were no longer speaking to each other. Can you imagine that? They were texting, what? staring at screens. They were oh. using their fingers, not their lips, you know, to, to communicate. And they were getting a speech therapist in to encourage children to actually speak. Wow. I mean, is that scary? That's so, scary. Yeah, so what we need is obviously not you know, to ban digital devices, but to put them literally in their place and, and to reinstate the teacher as the most important person ever mm. in the yeah. Yeah. You know, I know growing up in the States in the 1970s, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we we answered questions on tests. We didn't we weren't given models of critical thinking in our education. It was answering correctly. Uh, well, you see, the great privilege of when, I, when I've been at Oxford is we have the tutorial system, which is a one on one system, you know, with you and your tutor. Uh, and it is a given that you have done all the reading, you know all the facts, yeah? So what the tutorial does, and I've been both an undergraduate there and also a tutor there, is that's where you put things into context. That's where you discuss the implications of the facts. Uh, right. And that for me is certainly, a, 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 you know, as you're a slightly older level, you know, that's what university should be. It's not about doing a test and passing. It's more, it's a given that you've done your reading. That's, right. that's a given. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, otherwise, you don't have the tutorial. You go, oh. Um, but then you say, now we know these things. What, what does it mean? How does that compare with this? So, you know, let's put it off again. And that is the value of proper teaching mm -hmm. rather than just, you know, forcing people to recite things. And the way to get people to learn things is to get them so excited and motivated they'll just go and do the, the residual, you know, um, information processing by themselves. Yeah. So how does the brain do innovation? Like, how does this work and how, what does technologies affect, you know, the way that we innovate? And okay, let me tell you a little bit about how the brain adapts to the environment then. And for this, we have to turn to rats and mice, yeah? Uh, because obviously, if you're looking at how brain cells are working, there's not too many people going to volunteer. Um, the brain's done right. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so what you can do is you can expose a rat or a mouse to something, for example, a so-called enriched environment. Now, enrichment for a rat, doesn't mean to say they watch the, the TV and you're talking about TV program. <laughs> um, but it means that they're exposed to little ladders and wheels and, and uh, um, branches to swing and play and climb from. Yeah, so compared to the average fate of a laboratory rat or mouse, these guys are in Nirvana. They're having a lovely time. You know, they're, they're highly interactive, lots of objects to play with. And then if you look at a brain cell from an animal exposed to that enriched environment compared to someone in or a rat in an ordinary cage, you see something quite interesting. What you see is the brain cells have more branches. Now, let me explain why that's important and interesting. You'll be familiar that when you exercise, your muscles get bigger and stronger. And if, as happened to my brother when he broke his ankle recently, his calf muscle atrophied and got very weak very quickly, very, you know, slowed down to a lot of effort to get it back to normal. The brain is the same. You use it or you lose it. So what we know is if you make brain cells work hard, as happened with the rats in the enriched environment, the way they respond, the way they grow, is to grow these branches, okay? Now, by growing branches, what you're doing is increasing the surface area of the cell, okay? You've just got more space around. The cells have got more surface to it. That means it's easier for it to make connections with other brain cells because there's more space, obviously. Ah. This is, not, this is not rocket science. This is just very simple. <laughs> it's just got more space. So <laughs> recap, um, if you make brain cells work hard by an interactive stimulating environment, they respond by growing branches. And by growing branches, it's easier for them to make more connections with other brain cells. And guess what? You can make more connections. You can join up the dots. So then you can see that the extinction of the candle is the extinction of life. So you understand things. So uh, it's very... So, you know, that's slightly simplistic, but the way the brain works is constantly to be changing. Every moment you're alive, Jennifer, your brain is updating, upgrading, changing, modifying, shaping according to your interaction with the world. And there's some nice examples of this. There was a very famous one of London taxi drivers who 
Um, unlike New York taxi drivers, have to spend two years passing something called the knowledge, where they, without looking at a manual, they have to recite the names of all the streets of London, how to go around. And they have a huge burden on their working memory. I don't know if you knew this, but the, the, the um, okay, so the, the formal cabs in London, they have to pass this two year exam, you know, oral exam. Really? They do. That's why I miss when I get to other countries and places, there is a slight difference in the cab driver's knowledge, seems yeah. to be. Very sad. Anyway, so they've all heard of this, the, the, the London cab driver this study, because they showed that because they have therefore a huge burden on their working memory, an area of the brain relating to memory, if you scan the brains of London taxi drivers, it was actually bigger than in other people of the same age. And it's not that having... Wow. Yeah, it's an area called the hippocampus. It's not having a big hippocampus makes you a London taxi driver, but the other way around. <laughs> it's, it's bigger for the longer they've been driving. So if ever you come to London, ask the driver if he knows what the hippocampus is, and he will, I'm sure, because they've all heard of this study. Though. I'm going to try that next time. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone watching going to London, ask the driver if they know the hippocampus. So that's a very simple example of using it or losing it and your brain adapting to yeah. what you're doing. And so from the rat studies, we know it's because of these branches, which enables you to make connections. And sadly, just touching on dementia, I don't know if you, you want to or not, but as you're growing, you're getting more and more branches. And what distinguishes the growth of the brain in the first few years of life is not so much the proliferation of more brain cells, but more the connections between them. Yeah, so that's what makes you different. Even if you're a clone, an identical twin, you're going to be different because uh, you've got... Oh, and so, wow. As, so you see the world in your way because only you're living your life and your experiences. So that's, you know, so your mum, for example, you know, will be different from other ladies because she has more connections and so on. So what happens in Alzheimer's is sadly those connections are gradually dismantled. So you go back to being anyone watching who sadly has cared for someone with this tragic disease will know that the patient becomes more and more like a child into a booming, buzzing confusion where they can't understand things because they can't make the connections. Mm -hmm. And sadly, they're like an infant again where they're frightened by novel things. They're very confused. They don't quite understand what's happening because like a small child, they have to take the word at face value. There's nothing else for them. They, have, they don't have the checks and balances of those connections established by their experiences anymore. So, wow. uh, so that's, for me, the mind is not some airy-fairy alternative to the, the squalor of the physical brain. You know, I think the mind is the personalization of your brain through, oh. these, through this plasticity. Yeah? So when we talk about losing your mind with dementia, that's exactly what's happening. What's also interesting is you can blow your mind or lose your mind or be out of your mind, <laughs> like drug, sex, rock and roll or wine, women and song, what you can do there is you can temporarily disable the connections by taking psychoactive substances or putting yourself in an environment where the sensory press is so strong that it's meaningless. You know, you're, if you're, the snow is the snow in your face, it doesn't mean anything and the sun is the sun. And, um, yeah. So what's interesting there is people talk about having a sensational time. You don't say, let's go out now and have a cognitive time, do you? No one will come. Right. <laughs> Yeah, so we pay money to abrogate, abnegate our sense of self. And now we talk about blowing our mind, losing our mind. Ecstasy in Greek is to stand outside of yourself. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, an interesting thing. So losing the mind sometimes is something people pay money to do. So these connections are responsible for innovation in a sense and creativity. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. we personalize it by our own minds exactly. and experience. Exactly. Yeah, so... Um, each of us are unique individuals. No one, Jennifer, will be like you ever again. Of the 100,000 years we've stalked the planet, no one has been like you ever because no one has lived your life. Even, even if you had an identical twin, no one has lived your life. So this means that you, it's not your heart, your lungs, or your livers that's special. You know, it's, it's your brain because your brain has adapted and changed. And as you go through your life, you'll evaluate things in terms of what's happened already. Yeah? And, then, and then every experience will upgrade the connections. And meanwhile those connections will determine how you interpret the world. So do you think that sort of the corporate and even sometimes entrepreneurial mentality of like drinking the Kool-Aid, you know, when you kind of come into an organization and it's more about adapting to the culture, does that diminish innovation? Not at all, no, because it's a two-way street. You know, you'll be bringing something as much as you'll be impacting on the Kool-Aid conversation as much as it's impacting on you. You'll be adapting, you'll be changing. Yeah. Um, that's what life is. You're never the same as you were before. You're constantly evolving as a human being. And if you're in a certain new environment, both positive and negative, 
say you were in some awful war-torn place and had post-traumatic stress, that will that will obviously impact on you. And the same as suddenly being in a stimulating or exciting or awesome place will impact on you. So that's why the environment and how we shape the environment and the kind of environment we plan for our kids Mm. So important, yeah. You talk about some of the downfalls of gaming, but how can gaming actually help us learn in the business world? Um, that's an interesting premise. Certainly we know with gaming that it releases a chemical in the brain called dopamine, and dopamine is related not just to addiction, but also arousal and reward. It's, a, it's something that we like to get shots of with dopamine. Um, so in one sense, I suppose anything that... Um, you wanted that triggered dopamine that, that would be something but myself I, I would quest I'll challenge the premise I don't think in the corporate world having people playing games you know gaming is necessarily going to be what you want it depends what you want you know I mean, you might want people in a particular organization who've got strong like you might want drone pilots for example that'd be great or endoscopic surgeons another one um, but it's hard to see how in terms of interper anything that relies on interpersonal relationships, on judgment, on reflection, on imagination, I cannot see how a world that frankly is a childlike world of, you know, goodies and baddies uh, that is not nuanced. I can't see how that will give them insights into the mm. human condition. And can you imagine, for example, King Lear as a video game? No. <laughs> so maybe yeah. for organizations that have very... Yeah. 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 Uh, and what sounds about video games is I think it infantilizes people and the, by definition the characters are two-dimensional almost you know there's no there's no nuances um, so when you play a video game you don't care about the princess if you read a novel about a princess you care about her and they're both fictional princesses but you care about the princess in a book because she has a context she has relationships she has a life like you right. one someone's just a vicon in a video game you talk about um, technology's impact in reinforcing the individual in the book. Um, being, like you were just saying, independent beings with unique thoughts and ideas and perceptions of the world. What does this reinforcing of the individual mean for the future of businesses and how we operate? Okay, I think increasingly, as things become automated and easy to access and so on, the one thing that we cannot download is creativity and, and new insights and new ideas. And I think whilst in the past, a lot of the workforce had to do mechanical and dreary jobs, um, these can now be done by automated and technology devices. And so I think therefore increasingly we're looking for something that is inspirational and different. And as we're living longer lives, as so many people will live to be a hundred, um, I think people are thirsty and hungry for meaning to their lives, for people or things that help them understand themselves better, that help them understand the world around them better, in a way perhaps that 50 or, or 100 years ago, people didn't have that luxury. My mother was in the Blitz in London. She didn't have the luxury, just wanted to live. That was all she wanted. Right, survival. Yeah, it's and sadly, a lot of people around the world now are still in that condition, whereas we in our privileged, developed world can now indulge as no human being has been able to do before So, mm -hmm. in, a, in a group of saying, what do I want out of life? How can I develop myself? And I think that, first of all, encouraging people to give them the confidence to think about those things rather than fretting about, as my mum said when I went to this party, yeah, what are people going to think of me? Mm -hmm. If you can see people out from that fear, engendered, I have to say, by social networking so, so badly, you know, where everyone's constantly... Yeah having to ask approval, you know, from their 500 friends and right. their, uh, their yeah, they want their likes. <laughs> yeah, you know, identity is constructed externally. Yeah. You know, if you can disregard that, um, then I think that's a great bonus. So, I mean, obviously, I don't have a quick and easy answer to how to live the good life. It's something we've all debated. But what I do say is, let's look at the factors. And most importantly, let's have a debate on what do you want. I don't know if you have kids or not, but yeah. Well, if you did, what would you want them to be? What kind of talents would yeah. you want them? To, what talents do you yourself want to have? What kind of life? And this is something that we've never really thought. We all know what we don't want. But so rarely do we say, this is the life I'd like. This is the kind of skills I put a premium on. These are the things I don't care so much about. These are the things that are not important. These things are. Mm. And I think we should sit back and rather than fretting about how many friends we have and how many people like us, uh, what is the impact of digital culture on our productivity and results? Well, again, that's uh, that's another debatable point because attention spans are definitely shorter now. That's, um, and I think also 
in a way, people are becoming not so much like robots, but like little children. You know, that is very needy, um, not quite in control of their feelings, mm. not really aware of the impact of what they say and do on other people. I mean, a small child says, I, I hate you. Grown ups very rarely do, but they do now online. So they do. Like it's crazy. Because they don't, the whole terminology has got devalued. I hate you doesn't really mean anything. If you said someone's face, it certainly means something. You know, so, uh, so this notion of this rather childlike, needy, emotional, short attention span, slightly aggressive, but above all, self referential It's all about me. You know, look at me. I'm doing this. Look at me. I'm doing this. Here's my chocolate cake downloaded for reasons I do. <laughs> Um, you know, this is what I'm doing now and this is what I'm thinking now and here I am no, who cares yeah. who cares if you said now I've split the atom perhaps you know but yeah, on the whole it's not that interesting let's be frank Yeah, but people I think need to do it because they're in some kind of existential crisis you know they need to reassurance they exist yeah. so it would be lovely um, to get people as Biz Stern one of the co-founders of Twitter said and it's not healthy you should be using this as a means to an end not as your life I right. find that very strange. And so this maturation of empathy and identity that you talk about that can either, that can tend to be stunted by social media or technology, um, you know, how does this impact businesses? And what should we in, in either corporate world or entrepreneurs, what should we be looking to, how, how can we turn that around? Okay, I think it impacts businesses on, in lots of ways. First on the workforce, and that's perhaps the most important, you know, for anyone who aspires to good leadership, how can you inspire and excite these people who are some childlike, you know, who have got these short attention spans? I think there's lots of things we can do. So, for example, um, well, this, one is uh, to get out into the open air, and there's a study recently showing, um, with you know, tests of creativity, that that's enhanced. This is in Ann Arbor, where the control was to go downtown Ann Arbor and others to just stay in, and the others to go into the Arboretum there. The fact there's an Arboretum. Um, and they found the people who did the Arboretum were more creative afterwards. So, huh. very simple. Go yeah. Yeah, out there. Yeah. Um, another thing, I think, is to eat together. I think, you know, sharing of bread, I'm, I'm no anthropologist, but we know sitting around a table gives you more than just the coincidence of feeding with other human beings feeding. You know, when you're eating with people, it's a bonding situation, it's a way of exchanging ideas, it's a, a really nice thing to do. So I think um, the more you can do that. And the third way is to allow people to be private. You know, I think mm. it's often open plan offices and so on, people feel they're exposed or they have to put on a certain image. Um, but to cultivate a private inner self that you don't have to share with other people until you choose to, while well, you can incubate your ideas and then you have the confidence mm. to do. It. And I think to have an environment where people are not um, completely transparent and accountable and monitored all the time. Mm. Yeah, I think that that's important as well. And so what do you think is the future of creativity? Okay, well, I think it's something that anyone that's got it is going to be, you know, quids in. I think that's going to be very good. Uh, there's a lovely quote by Asimov from 50 years ago where he said the future of mankind, he said psychiatry will be dominant and so on. And he said the true elite, I haven't got the quote in front of me, the true elite will be those who are creative and the rest will merely serve a machine. And he said that in 1964. Yeah? Wow. Um, wow. I, yeah, exactly. I, look it up. I, Isaac Asimov, okay, he said this. Message. And I think... It wouldn't be brilliant if we could liberate people from merely serving the machine. I myself hate this notion of elitism. You know, I really don't like it. And I come from a country where inevitably it's something that's discussed all the time. Mm. Etc. Um, this notion that someone is better than someone else. Or, you know, everyone is a unique individual and we only have to find ways in which we can harness their talents mm. and give them a sense of satisfaction where they're not competing with other people, but they're competing, as I say to my students, you're competing with yourself last week. That's your biggest rival. Which is, so I think that creativity can come in many forms. You know, it's not necessarily writing a, a symphony or a novel. It can be in science. A lot of people don't realize that. You see the world in different ways. But I think also it can be just rearranging the kitchen in a different way, you know, or rearranging your day in a different way. Uh, and it's, it's a lovely feeling to suddenly see or do something no one else has seen or done before. Yeah. You know, and that, however modest, um, is a lovely buzz that is another way of establishing you as an identity.